All right, so this is chapter one, jurisdiction and venue in cyberspace. We'll actually be looking at uh, the history of the internet. I'll just uh, skip it, but we'll be focusing on different types of jurisdiction. So what jurisdiction means and their different types so what they are what they are uh, such as the subject matter one the personal jurisdiction and also in rem jurisdiction and we'll look at uh, service of process so how defendants know they are being sued and then we'll also look at this concept called minimum contacts for a website owner. So um, for a state uh, court to establish jurisdiction over a website, uh, the minimum contact uh, contacts concept has to be uh, met or requirement has to be met. So we'll look into details of this. And We'll end this chapter by looking at choice of law and forum selection clause. Uh, trust me, even lawyers confuse those two uh, provisions. So it is uh, very important and also interesting to understand the difference of uh, both what a choice of law means and what a forum selection uh, means. So, um, as I said, the history of the internet, um, I wouldn't uh, regard this as too relevant nowadays. You have um, three paragraphs in your, two paragraphs actually, in your textbook, so it's just reading for, um, in case you're more interested. But, um, Let's look at the definition of cyber law. So what is cyber law actually? Um, so cyber law has to be understood as one of the law fields, one of law topics that will deal with uh, the internet. And not only internet as means of communication, but also now internet of things and everything else related to uh, communication over the internet and this field of law uh, will deal with several cases statutes and regulations that uh, affect other types of law fields or legal fields so in we can say that in very few circumstances, cyber law has its own body of law. But in most cases, as we've, we've seen already through chapters uh, two, three, and four, um, cyber law is also interested into other types uh, of legal fields, such as intellectual property, so copyright, patents, uh, trademarks, but also contract law, tort law, we'll see further down this course. Um, so even though cyber law uh, can be uh, narrowly defined, so the legal aspects related to the internet, we should keep in mind that other law fields, other legal fields are also relevant um, when we are studying cyber law, when we are studying um, IT law, um, the cyber um, world or environment. So that's important and you've already gotten a taste of uh, what I'm, I'm saying now, looking at the uh, different IPs, um, intellectual properties uh, as of now. So moving on, we'll look at uh, jurisdiction. 
So we'll understand what it is and then look at the different types of uh, jurisdiction. So jurisdiction in simple words uh, means a court's power to decide a particular case or to render a decision over a particular case. So in other words, jurisdiction is, um, the question that comes to mind would be, so you need to sue a company. Where would you sue? Will you sue it in California? Will you sue the company in New York, in Texas, in Utah? So what is the court that has power to adjudicate, to solve your dispute with that particular company or even a person? So jurisdiction is this, um, where the lawsuit will be uh, handled. And so we say that the uh, courts in California have jurisdiction over this, or courts in New York or in New York will have jurisdiction over that. So it means that courts in that state have jurisdiction over that specific matter. Okay, so that's what the jurisdiction means. And we have uh, three main types of jurisdictions. So the first one is subject matter. So the law, the statutes, they say that for some specific subject matters, uh, a specific court will have jurisdiction. So, for example, uh, federal courts uh, in the U.S., and we've seen this already, uh, federal courts, they are the ones adjudicating uh, intellectual property uh, disputes. So they have jurisdiction. Uh, remember we discussed in chapter 4 for patent. If uh, the USPTO, the US uh, Patent and Trademark Office, denies a patent, you, after appealing uh, within U USPTO, uh, and if that uh, denial is kept, uh, so you can bring this dispute to federal courts. So it means over the subject matter of a patent, federal courts will have jurisdiction. So that is the jurisdiction uh, with regards to subject matter. In REM jurisdiction is related to jurisdiction over a particular thing or property. So for example, most uh, in most cases, there are exceptions, but very few, in most cases, a court uh, of um, of a location of a property will have jurisdiction over matters related to that property. So what I'm saying is, if I have a farm in Texas, and let's say I sell this farm, and the buyer wants to sue me for any issues with the farm or with this um, uh, property, so the lawsuit would be handled by uh, a court in Texas because the property is located in Texas. So this is the in-rem jurisdiction. And personal jurisdiction, the last one is related to jurisdiction over a person. Uh, so the best example here is the most common actually. Uh, and again, this is the general rule that are exceptions, but the general rule is that uh, a lawsuit has to be started in the place of residence of the defendant. So let's say you are suing uh, someone who lives in Florida, then you have to start the lawsuit in Florida because the court in Florida has uh, have jurisdiction over a resident of that state. Okay, so this is something that your lawyer um, must be knowledgeable about if you need to start a lawsuit. But it's important for you for, for us to understand because it may help us uh, decide whether we want to sue someone or a company or not. Uh, by the way, in most cases, 
Uh, again, general rule, there are exceptions, but in most cases, when a consumer transaction is uh, related, um, the laws, they protect the consumer, not the company. So in most cases, uh, it is possible to sue the company. Even though you are the plaintiff, you can sue the company in your own um, state of residence. But still, um, there are um, other situations, uh, and we'll see in this chapter, when there's a forum selection uh, clause in your contract, and that forum selection uh, reads that the courts of New York have jurisdiction over any disputes arising from your relationship, then, regardless of where you live, if you want to sue that company, you would need to start a lawsuit in New York. So you would need to pay lawyers there. You would uh, potentially need to travel there for the hearing, etc. So it's important to understand um, jurisdiction. Okay, so again, subject matter related to what the um, lawsuit is about. For example, I've given you the patent, federal courts, in rem related to something or a property. Best example is a location of a real property, a farm, a house, an apartment, etc. And personal jurisdiction uh, related uh, to a particular person. Best example is the defendant's. Uh, place of residence. So uh, moving on, we uh, it is important for us to analyze uh, what minimum contacts uh, mean. This uh, came or was originated in this case, International Shoe Co. versus Washington. So in this case, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, decided that the test for personal jurisdiction uh, should be the minimum contacts. So there's this test uh, to establish whether uh, that website or the person actually that is being sued has minimum contacts within a state or not. So let's say uh, we are Facebook and we want to sue a user um, who who lives in not in California but who lives in uh, Utah? So the idea is that, or uh, better, the user wants to sue uh, Facebook that is based in California. So if the user starts the lawsuit in Utah, then the Utah courts, based on this international shoe uh, company case. The Utah courts will need to establish whether Facebook has, uh, not has, but meets the minimum contacts requirement uh, for Utah or not. Because if it, if it does not meet the requirements, then the lawsuit would need to be started in California, not in uh, Utah. And uh, so, how do we know what is this minimum contact uh, requirement? So the defendant, because you are suing someone, so the defendant uh, has to have made business within that state you want to sue, eventually incorporated in that state, so has established a company there. Or if it is a person has visited the state uh, frequently, has done uh, business there uh, more frequently. So a state where a defendant does not reside there or a defendant which is a company that is not established in that state will not uh, most likely will not meet the minimum contacts uh, requirement. Okay, hence the lawsuit will not be able uh, to be started there. Uh, let's look at another example. 
uh, this case, the Boschetto or Boschetto uh, versus Hansen. So, um, what is this case about? Uh, the plaintiff purchased a car on eBay from a private seller that reside in Wisconsin. And then the uh, plaintiff started the lawsuit in California, but started the lawsuit against someone who resides in uh, Wisconsin. So first thing is, the California court would need to establish, to establish as per uh, International Shoe Company, uh, that the Wisconsin seller has or had minimum contacts in California. And the court, in this case, the court decided that no, a private seller that resides in a different state, or this specific uh, seller, uh, to be more precise, did not have uh, sufficient minimum contacts in California, so that the California, the courts in California, could uh, acquire personal jurisdiction. So a lawsuit here would need to be started in Wisconsin, not in California. So, uh, courts in general, they understand that if you own a website and your website is only passive, is only for information, uh, and it's available everywhere, it's available not only in the country, but um, all over the world. So, uh, only, have, only having or maintaining a passive website uh, does not um create sufficient uh, minimum contacts to be sued in a specific state however if you have an active website in which uh, users are interacting uh, more actively then this could um, be regarded as having minimum contacts in any given state so plaintiffs would need to would be able to sue um, your company in their own state okay so that's what is uh, important with regards to minimum contacts because uh, the idea here is to establish if the defendant has um, has established the minimum contacts to be sued in a state where the defendant does not reside or in a state where the defendant is not incorporated if we are talking about a company. All right, so moving on, let's look at uh, the service of process. And what is this about? Well, the service of process is when you are informing the defendant that you are suing them. How do defendants know they are being sued? They receive a, a notice. Here in BC, for example, they receive a notice of um, civil claim. And receiving this notice is called as service of process. So the service of process in, in more technical words is, uh, means that uh, when there's formal delivery of the litigation documents, the uh, petition that starts the lawsuit and any documents that accompany it, uh, or the delivery of uh, summons, so when someone has to appear in court, this is what is known as the service of process. And it is important to understand this because there are rules that make a service of process legal or not. So if you do not follow these rules and rules in the US that are prescribed in the federal rules of civil procedure, if you do not follow those, uh, the service of process may be regarded as illegal. Hence, 
your lawsuit will not uh, evolve, will not be uh, looked into further because you have not duly and legally served uh, the defendant. And what are the main types of uh, service of process? So the main one is personal service. So you get a stamped court uh, document or stamped um, copy of the summons or of a writ or any other uh, legal uh, process. And then you personally serve uh, with the defendant. And there are companies that provide this service. A service to provide uh, service of process. And then they document and they make it, they guarantee they make it in a legal way. So the main type is personal service. But there are uh, some cases in which you can also use certified mail. So you can mail uh, those documents uh, with certified uh, type so that you get a certification that the mail was uh, duly and properly delivered. And in exceptional circumstances where, uh, for example, the defendant cannot be found, uh, a judge may allow uh, publication in a newspaper. But this is... Uh, only on an exceptional basis. Um, the most common one is personal service, second uh, by certified mail. And can service uh, be done via uh, electronic means? Yes, it is new. But yes, if defendants have uh, in some way, some way that can be uh, assured that can be certified, uh, consented to be served by uh, electronic means, then a uh, service of process by electronic means will be valid. Okay? And it is important to note here that this consent has to be express. And by express, uh, I mean has to be written cannot be implied, has to be in a physical form. So could could also be via electronic means, uh, but it has to be uh, clear in a physical form, not in an implied way because of the conduct, because of uh, in the past, uh, the, the defendant accepted via electronic means. So I presume, I will assume that the defendant has consented. No, such presumption uh, does not work. The consent has to be express. Okay? Has to be in a physical uh, form. So this is how we um, inform, the plaintiff informs, uh, but also how courts uh, reach out to uh, people uh, in case they need to appear in court or in case um, either because they are a defendant or because they are a witness. So um, the, the proper way is the service of process. Uh, now we look at, uh, we detail a bit more the uh, minimum context for websites. Uh, actually, I've mentioned this uh, already to you. So just uh, reiterating here that a passive website um, usually does not uh, establish sufficient uh, minimum contacts. So let's say I have a website offering legal services and it is there. I have a contact form, uh, etc. but it's just my bio, uh, areas that I, um, uh, I am of uh, service, etc. So it's just passive. People are just getting information. But if you have uh, a more active website in which uh, users are interacting, are either playing or downloading or doing something in the website. So chances are higher that the minimum contacts uh, will be established there. In any event, courts, they decide this on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, now, we look at choice of law provision, and remember I 
told you that even lawyers, they uh, confuse uh, choice of law provision and forum selection clause. But I hope I can make it uh, very clear to you. So choice of law, choice of law. So the words here are clear. You are choosing a law, a specific law. So parties in contracts, they are in most cases, general rule, again, there are always exceptions, but in most cases, parties, they can choose what law will be applicable to their transaction. And this is very, very common in international transactions. Because if a party that is based in the US is doing business with another party based in England, so the English party, they want English law to apply. But the American party, they want American law to apply. So there's a kind of uh, an issue here, kind of uh, a dispute to start with. So they could choose a different law. So let's say they, they decide to choose here uh, German law. Or they decide to choose an international treaty. Let's say they are dealing with the sale of goods. So they decide to choose the um, International Convention on Sale of Goods because it is supranational. Uh, some countries have ex adopted it. So they are not choosing uh, any one specific uh, law, but they are choosing one that is uh, more international. So the choice of law provision is this. When parties... To a contract, they choose what law will apply. And this is highly used in, uh, for websites, in, in the internet. So most companies, in their terms and conditions, so you can read terms and conditions of several websites, they usually say that the law of California, the law of the United States, uh, the law of this or that will apply to... Uh, any disputes arising out of uh, the use of our website or the use of our services, etc., etc. So this is a choice of law provision is a provision in a contract in which parties choose a specific law. What if parties don't choose a law? Well, if they don't choose a law, the laws of a country will be automatically applied okay so could be the laws of a country or a specific state and parties will choose a law because of uh, the freedom to contract so there's this principle that in most cases parties are free to contract in whatever they want uh, except what is prohibited what is illegal and one of those things they can choose is the law, okay? So that's the choice of law provision. Whereas when we talk about the forum selection clause, so forum is the venue, is the place. So forum selection clause is related to jurisdiction, the court's power. Where, where will the lawsuit be started not what law will be applied what law will be applied to that relationship to that legal relationship is the choice of law provision but the forum selection clause is the clause that says any disputes arising out of this relationship or this con contract will be handled by the courts in california will be handled by the courts in the uh, orange county or the Los, Los Angeles County. So it is the place what courts have jurisdiction. Okay? It is not related to the choice of law. But some lawyers, and I would call this as not proper drafting, some lawyers, they mix the choice of law clause with the forum selection clause. I I don't like doing this. I'd rather have a choice of law clause. So it is very clear that the law 
the laws of this uh, of the province of British Columbia and the laws of Canada will be applicable to this contract. So this is the choice of law clause. And I would say that the courts in BC uh, have jurisdiction over any matters, any disputes arising uh, out of this contract. This would be the forum selection clause. I would separate them. But some lawyers, some contract templates, they bring those together. Okay, so this is also one reason uh, why there's confusion with those two clauses. And there is a possibility, uh, for, for example, uh, the first example I gave you, two companies, one based in the United States, the order in England. So they decide to choose the CISG, the Convention on the International of Sales of Goods, for their contract. But what court will they decide? Will they decide of a court, uh, the American courts have jurisdiction, the English courts have jurisdiction, or the Australian one, or uh, let's say it will be arbitration, uh, so could be Paris, could be, uh, I don't know, Hong Kong. So uh, you see how things are actually and indeed different. One is choosing what law will be applicable to the legal relationship. The other the forum selection clause is what court will have jurisdiction. And something you don't want in your contract is to choose a court that usually does not handle cases based on a different law. So what I mean here is why would you choose New York courts, for example, and also you would choose for German law. Do you think that the courts in New York have experience uh, with German law? They may have, they can study, judges can study, but still, this is not preferable. This is not recommended. So parties also need to be aware of this. Uh, even though those two clauses are different, as I explained, but you don't want to choose a uh, court to have jurisdiction and a law that is not commonly used by that court, by those judges, because you may have decisions that are not good, or you may need to translate laws, etc. Okay, so parties will usually take uh, this into consideration. And the last part um, I want to mention to you here is the full faith and credit clause. So this comes from the Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the American Constitution. And this full faith and credit clause uh, prescribes that states, they are required to give legal effects, to give effects of any acts, public records, and even judicial decisions that come from other states. Because similarly, in Canada. So in Canada, we know that provinces, they have some power, some exclusive power. And in the US, states also have some exclusive power. For example, uh, states in, in uh, the US, they have ex exclusive power for criminal law. That's why in some states you have uh, death uh, punishment. In some states, uh, marijuana. Uh, is allowed and in other states it is not because the states they have uh, exclusive power over criminal law and what this full faith and credit clause is saying is that as long as a decision was rendered was given by a state who had proper jurisdiction for that matter for those uh, people plaintiffs and defendants so as long as those requirements are met, their decisions, they have to be accepted in a different state. Okay, so that is very important. So again, um, in that uh, example, in let's say the uh, example of the uh, California and Wisconsin uh, private seller. So let's say 
the court in Wisconsin had jurisdiction. And let's say the seller won the lawsuit and the seller would need to enforce the judgment in California against the plaintiff because the assets of the plaintiff are in California. So what the full uh, faith and credit clause says is that the judgment rendered in Wisconsin uh, would need to be accepted uh, in California by courts uh, in California. Okay, so that is uh, very important because uh, as we discussed, uh, let's say a website does not establish minimum contacts, but you can still, you can sue in another state where the company is based, for example, uh, but you can use those documents in your own state. Your courts will accept or any other uh, state uh, public body will need to accept those doc documents based on the uh, full faith and credit clause. Okay, so this is a bit shorter and just as a very brief uh, review, we discussed um, what cyber law is, the, the several uh, topics of law, fields of law that are uh, very much related to cyber law. And then we went through the discussion and, and learning and understanding more about jurisdiction, what it is. So it is the uh, court's power over, uh, over disputes to render a decision to adjudicate uh, matters. And we learned that our three main types of jurisdiction, uh, being them the subject matter jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, and in rem for thing or property. And we also discussed the service of process, so how defendants become aware they are being sued or how people are, uh, become aware they have to appear in court. This is called the service of process and the types that are used, mostly used are personal service, but there's also certified uh, mail or in exceptional circumstances uh, by publication in a newspaper and more uh, in more modern times, if uh, parties have consented in an express way, in a clear way, not by conduct, conduct but um, in a physical form, uh, then they can also be served via uh, electronic uh, means. And we ended uh, going through more details over the minimum contacts. Uh, to establish their jurisdiction over a uh, different state. And we, we also looked at the choice of law provision or choice of law clause in a contract and the forum selection clause. And I um, called your attention for their difference. So it's very important to understand how different they are and what is the, the purpose of each one. And the last part was the full faith and credit clause related to documents, decisions, court decisions from other states that have to be accepted in uh, another state. Thank you, and I'll uh, see you again in chapter um, five. Bye.